once people break the stranger barrier and become a, a real person to them, that changes everything. So you have to be willing to reach out to the world until someone really uh, hires you or gives you an opportunity. Welcome to the Become a Game Composer show. thought it would be interesting um, for our listeners just to hear a little bit about uh, the background of how we met, which I think is really interesting and hopefully inspiring for other game composers who are looking to meet other game composers, which is probably one of the biggest, um, I don't know, one of the biggest desires of younger composers is they want to work and they want to spend time with the people that they look up to. Um, so I remember it was about six years ago in 2014, I had just graduated from uh, Columbia College, Chicago. And uh, part of that program is you actually move out to Los Angeles and you have a summer internship. And I, I distinctly remember that I reached out to you just to see if I could come visit and come meet you in person. So Gary, you invited me to your studio and you were very kind to allow me to just spend some time actually on your computer and, and working with some of your files. Um, and I just remember you asked me if I had any contact skills and if I could edit some of your recording sessions to use as playable sample instruments, which I thought was such a cool request. Um, and I just distinctly remember that you went and you, you showed me a lot of trust and it was very honoring that you would ask if I could work on these things. And you actually left the house for a bit of time and um, that was just such a, a wonderful experience for me. And so I ended up doing that for several days. And I remember that afterwards you invited me to Video Games Live, uh, which was performing in uh, Los Angeles that year. And it was, such a, it, it was an amazing experience that you would ask me to be a part of that. And I just remember uh, going backstage and there were a circle of a ton of A-list composers just kind of hanging around, pounding around. And um, that has actually led to some, some future uh, here we are six years later. That's actually led to some amazing relationships and friendships that have lasted. And I just wanted to thank you personally for, for giving me, a young composer, a chance. And that has actually inspired me. Um, it's really the whole purpose of this show and, and my entire education business, which is to help young composers take that next step to meet other composers and to really just get that, uh, that inspiration. Um, so I appreciate you, and I'm so glad to have you here today. Sure. Thanks for inviting me, Steve. And, and I'm really um, happy that that experience uh, led to other experiences. And I think that that's a, a lesson that any uh, up and coming composer, someone who's starting their career needs to take very, very uh, seriously. Because look, we're in, we're in a world where uh, it's people that hire people, you know, and you have to, you have to make, you have to be, uh, put yourself out there into the world and meet people who are uh, busy and active in the business and uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, certainly if you're starting offer to intern for them. Uh, if, if someone is looking for an assistant position, it may be difficult to get that assistant opportunity. If you've, have never worked for another composer. You're just getting out of college or wherever. So on the other hand, if someone uh, asks for an internship uh, or uh, instead, then that may be an opportunity to work for someone who would not normally hire you. And then if you've proven valuable, I mean, if someone is in need of an assistant and you've met them and you're talking to them and you are no longer a stranger, um, that's a much better situation for getting hired. That could put you, give you an opportunity to all of a sudden be working full time for a composer uh, or part time or whatever and earning income and getting all kinds of experiences, writing music, uh, orchestrating music, doing technical aspects uh, like you were helping me with, all those sorts of, of things um, are really, really super important. And it all stems from you as an individual reaching out and finding people and, and not being afraid of no. Um, no's lead to yes. So, uh, it, you know, if you, have the, um, if you have the ability to withstand a lot of no's, you will get yeses as well. So no, 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 yes. This is what happens in the real world. Someone will say yes to you. Anybody who's ever sold anything, um, knows this very well, that not everyone is a buyer, but someone will eventually buy. And, they, and that means buy your services, your, 
you're uh, hiring. So um, it, it's really critical that you reach out when you're first starting and, and make connections. And, and you never know if the connection you make will lead, like you said, to third uh, connections to third persons and recommendations and just information about, hey, what if you did this, that, or the other thing? Once people be, once people break the the stranger barrier, you know, and uh, become a, a real person to them and someone who's um, flesh and blood and they they personally like and who's talented, that changes everything. So you have to be willing to reach out to the world and to find people and to be willing to accept uh, uh, no's and, you know, okay, maybes and, you know, nebulous answers until someone really uh, hires you or gives you an opportunity. And this could be, all, it's, it's not necessarily only reaching out to composers to, to assist, but reaching out to uh, video game companies, um, audio directors, uh, music directors, at video game companies. Those are people too. And once you break the stranger barrier, it's a new, I've never mentioned. That <laughs> That's word, a great term. I, I think it. it's a good one. Straight, you know, <laughs> that you, you, because we are, uh, social animals. And, you know, if you don't, if someone's a stranger, you, you don't readily let them in. Uh, but as soon as you get to know someone and you start having a conversation and you start uh, maybe helping them in some way, that changes everything. Okay. So that's, that's really critical to someone beginning their career, not only having the skills and the equipment and the knowledge, but it's, being willing to put yourself out there and meet people. That's a ton of great advice. Thank you for that. One of the, I'd say the focal point of this show, besides helping composers learn the craft of, of composing for games, it's also about helping composers focus on their family first and helping them use it as a filter for the projects they choose, use it as a filter for how they get work and really their work-life balance. So how do you structure your life to put your family first as a game composer? Well, my wife may answer differently. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I've met you. I know you. I've met your family and I believe that you do. I really do. No, I do. I do make time for my family. And I try, what I try to do is somewhere around five o'clock, take a few hours to be with the family, have dinner uh, and spend some time. And then I, I do like to come back at the work around nine or 10 o'clock at night, literally, and review what I wrote that day, because I often have a fresh ear at that point. You've been away from her for a few hours and I, I find all of a sudden I go, oh yeah, that sucked or that's great. And let me, or, but I can improve this. Or I have an idea for a counter melody or I, I have a different sound I could use, or I could orchestrate this better. All those sorts of ideas come to me at night and I'll sometimes then work till 12. And usually I quit around 12. When I really get slammed, I'm working seven days a week, but I like to try to spend time on the weekends and go somewhere. Now this has been a crazy time because of COVID. Uh, and so we're all kind of, uh, you know, on lockdown, uh, but we do, we'll just, we'll drive places. We'll just drive down to the beach and drive along the coast and just to get out, just change our, our, you know, vibe. And by the way, you know, I've always had the belief and I, I remember I had a long time assistant, assistant Peter Bateman. And I told Peter, I said, you know, he was, he got married to a, another composer, Suna. Uh, and she and she and him started to have kids. And I said, you know what? When you start to have kids, the universe provides <laughs> God, universe, whatever you want to call it. it. It's like it knows you have. And it, it sure enough, that was true for him. It was true for me when I, I didn't have a kid until rel relatively late in my life. My, um, so I was in my 40s when my son was born. And things change. Uh, the universe, I don't know, I, I, maybe that's too mystical for some, some people, but I, it, 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 I think it's true. I, I really do. So it's like, don't stop your life to just be a composer, have, have a life, have relationships, have children, if that's, if that is something you want. And um, the universe will provide. Now there's probably someone listening right now who goes, it didn't for me, you know, <laughs> but you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I really, I, I believe it and uh, take it for what you want. 
I think Simon Sinek would call that finding your why. Essentially, it's for me, family is my why. It's you know, I have have four kids, and that that can feel it, it's really a choice. I could choose for that to consume all of my time and energy, but instead, I flip it and I allow that to be my um, my fuel and energy on the days that I don't feel like writing music. You know, on the days that I don't, I don't feel like doing the admin work or answering emails or doing all the things that we didn't sign up to be as composers. But it just comes with the the territory of running a business and. I find that that by choosing a very clear why, for me, it's family. So, it, you know, it fuels me on those days. I, I would consider you to be a rather successful composer. You have a very long, lucrative career. Um, do you believe that the success in your life is a result of luck or goal setting? Well, I, I, I don't want to completely discount luck, excepting, you know, the famous... Uh, baseball player quote, I don't remember his name, who said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, I think, you know, so luck, uh, luck occurs to all of us, but you cannot take advantage of the luck unless you are prepared. Okay. So if you put yourself out there and you try, I mean, it's, it's, it's literally, the, if you um, throw, toss a coin, you're going to have a certain number of heads. So yes, luck whatever you want to call it, um, odds or patterns will eventually will at times favor you, but they will, if, if you have an opportunity that, that pre presents itself, unless you're in a position to really fully take advantage of it, you have the skills and you have the, the ability that you've developed through planning and through preparation, you won't be able to take advantage of it. And then there's been some very well-known I've heard of anyways, well-known, at least in our industry, opportunities of composers who've gotten opportunities to do major motion pictures and just bombed out. They just didn't have what, what it took. Um, and so uh, when those opportunities come, you have, you have to do well. You're working, especially on big projects, on multi-million dollar you know, franchises or games or films, whatever it is you're scoring. And uh, you're part of a team. And if you can't do stuff that they feel is going to be cool and help the project, you're, they're going to replace you, you know? So, yeah, so luck in, luck is just, you know, it, when you keep trying and keep putting yourself out there, it's, those, it's just opportunities that occur when you're, when you're doing that. Can you, think, can you think back to any circumstances specifically to any games in your career that were a direct result of being prepared for the moment that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to take the job? Well, I think um, every, every project I've done, I had to be prepared for. I'll give you an example of luck. <laughs> you want to hear a luck example? Sure, That's sure. what really got me into video games. Uh, my agent at the time sent, sent, this is in 2004, so fax machines were still technology still a, te a usable technology, yeah. shall we say. And uh, my agent sent over a fax with my resume on it to THQ, which which was, they're no longer around, but which big pub, uh, game publisher back then. And uh, it was sitting on the fax machine and an, an executive there saw my resume and it was my girlfriend's roommate from college. And she had become an executive at THQ and she's, I know him. And that started a process where they asked to hear some of my music. And then I ended up scoring Destroy All Humans. Now, when I got Destroy All Humans, they wanted this Bernard Herman-esque score. And so they asked for a demo to prevent. Now I had scored something in the uh, earlier decade before that was uh, in the style of Bernard Herman, and I had had an orchestra to record it. You know, it was my music, but it just had the, the total vibe of Herman. That's what they had wanted. So I sent them that and they went, oh, this is perfect. This is awesome. So that's why I got the gig. Um, and then when I got the gig, they again, they wanted this Bernard Herman-esque kind of sound because it was a game, uh, Destroy All Humans, for those who don't know, uh, was a game about an, a little alien coming to Earth from another planet. So and they, Bioshock Zero. <laughs> right. But uh, it, 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 they wanted this sort of, and, and it takes place in the 1950s. So they wanted this sort of the day the Earth stood still vibe which is of course famous score by bernard herman with theremin and orchestra and 
I loved Bernard Herman and was totally prepared to write in that style. It's so fascinating because you, you're just calling that luck, but I would, I just from my vantage point, because you were prepared for that and you had already done a project similar, and you can almost snowball this. Um, we were talking about Bioshock, but in all reality, that is almost identical to the style of Bioshock and how it's set in the past and it has this old timey vibe. Is that something that you believe was a result of Destroy All Humans? Like a direct result of that game led to Getting the next Bioshock? Game? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because the audio director, Emily Ridgway, got hired to be the audio director for Irrational Games and they were making Bioshock. <laughs> So there she hired me. So absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I scored yeah. a couple of games in between that, um, doing Destroy All Humans. Uh, but that was a direct consequence, absolutely, of scoring Destroy All Humans. Was getting into game scoring ever part of the plan? You said you mentioned how that fax, no. that fax incident happened. <laughs> so were you just 100% dedicated to doing film and then that film and shifted? TV. I, did, I hadn't even realized how cool games were. I was not a gamer. I didn't play any games. I think I played Pong in the 80s. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I was not into games. And so this game, Destroy Humans, came as, I mean, I was, it was, I was perfectly aware that gaming was getting more sophisticated and um, you had Sony PlayStation, which was, you know, but it wasn't until the late 90s that gaming started to really pick up and become much more popular with the PlayStation and the Xbox and then um, take off. And, but as soon as I saw how sophisticated and how interesting Destroy All Humans was, then I started to focus on gaming and going to the Game Developers Conference each year and reaching out to people, changing agents with the focus on not, not only, I mean, I, I still consider myself a game composer. I scored a film last year, but I, I, I still, I would say much of my work for the last 15 years has been games you know, and projects related to gaming. So, um, and I love it. I love writing, scoring games. I, it's, it's the coolest. Hmm. The most interesting music anyone has ever asked me to write has been for games by far. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. From the creative perspective and it has the added advantage of being, uh, uh, you know, um, populated with really nice people, really down to earth, pleasant, lovely people. That doesn't mean if they don't like something, they won't tell you. They will tell you just as in a film or TV show. If they don't like something, they will tell you and you will rewrite it. Fine. But just in general, they are really personality wise. Uh, I just love working in the gaming industry because of the type of people. I still enjoy scoring the picture, but guess what? You get to score a picture in many games. And as a matter of fact, I've like Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor. I scored hours worth of uh, cinematics and they were beautifully rendered and they were interesting moments emotionally to score with all kinds of different, you know, everything from intense combat to very emotional, you know, heartfelt moments. That poses an interesting thought. I come from a film background and then more or less shifted into video games, um, which I guess is, is your story after all. Yet what I do as an education brand is I teach composers how to start from the beginning as composers. Do you feel like there is value in those composers learning those film scoring techniques, knowing that cutscenes are really becoming a big part of games now? Yes. The answer is yes and yes. And by the way, if, if some, I don't, I do not think that someone should consider themselves a game composer. If an opportunity comes along to score a television series, go for it. H hell yeah. You know, I'm sorry. You, you should go uh, or film or, or scoring, a, uh, you know, uh, any kind of, any kind of a scoring project that someone's paying you to write music and, and or writing music for a production, production music, uh, these are trailer music, whatever, you know, these, this is really all part of all the opportunities. Cause you're not, why would you want to turn down an opportunity to score something? So I, I consider myself an audio visual comp um, composer. If it's, you know, music for film, TV games, I'm totally there, you know? Um, so it, 
just as I wouldn't recommend anyone who's starting um, just to score films that sh they should absolutely consider games. And I, when I first started teaching at USC, when I've been teaching there for about a decade, I would say over half of the students, sometimes, yeah, over at least over half, were kind of only mildly interested in games. Hmm. Nowadays, gaming is huge among hmm. students. They're much, they're, they're, some of them are saying, you know, I just want to score games. Well, I, I, I understand that, but, I'll, you know, and you never know. You might score some little picture and some game developer sees that movie and, and says, who's that composer? But you never know. I mean, the, 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 you know, Michael Giacchino, of course, started yeah, very uh, famous with example, Medal of Honor yeah. and then and then ended up scoring, you know, Pixar feature films. <laughs> and, yeah. Exactly. Wow. So, I mean, it, it all, they all feed in and relate to one another and are not, to me, it is part of the same fabric of opportunity and uh, you should take advantage of I mean, If you're trying to make a living, you have to do, you know, basically take any opportunity to write music for XYZ. And, and the one downside economically from gaming is there's very little back end from ASCAP, BMI, the performing rights um, opportunities. There's some money from performing rights, but nothing like TV. And I have to say, there were there were times because I did so much television and uh, when I first started out that that income from ASCAP, I'm an ASCAP member, um, uh, stay, saved me. I had consistent income coming in from ASCAP at, during periods of time when things were slow. So it's I'm just giving you my opinion, which is. It's all part of the same fabric of opportunity that, you know, you should take. Do you feel like you have equally progressed in each of those fields simultaneously? Or do you feel like taking a film project detracts from, let's say, your, if your true passion or love is to write for video games, are you suggesting to just kind of take whatever comes and always say yes to everything? Or are there some times that you would say no? Well, you, I think you would say no if uh, you it, it means compromising another project you're on. Like if you are so slammed with work uh, that you can't, you just can't give it your attention. So either you build a team and you have people who can help you when you get really busy, or you may have to turn something down if you have if you if you really feel you can you'll compromise it. But I I've, I've always found that there's always ways to do it, you know. Yeah, I kind of meet in the middle there. I feel like I should say yes so long as my schedule allows for it and it's a, a rate that reflects what I'm currently doing. But instead of saying no to things, I've I've learned over the years to grab help, build a team for that project, or to, you know, see if one of my composer friends who might be in a, a little bit newer and can handle the, the, the lower rate, et cetera, just try to equip them with it instead. But I feel like by saying a hard no to anything, you're ending a relationship before you give it a chance to, to blossom, ultimately. I agree. And, and, I, and I agree with your rate. When, I, when you say rate, I mean, there's many reasons to take or not take a project. Um, but if, if someone is offering you no money, but they're not let, letting you, for instance, keep your publishing or they're real, or, or they're, they're saying that if the project is successful, you won't be um, also earn money with them. Those are projects to turn down, but you know, there's, there, there are reasons to do projects that pay next to nothing. If, if it's a create, if it's a creative opportunity, so you yeah. have to, you just have to choose, choose very carefully. You know, if someone, I, I turned down a movie uh, a couple of years ago that was just, I when I watched the movie, I so despised it <laughs> that I said, <sit> <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it, it, it actually had, it actually had some, I actually, actually ended up writing a song for it because I wrote a song before I saw the movie. Um, and the song turned out really nice, and I'm happy to have done that, and they paid me for that. But it, the movie was just, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to score it. So th th there are there are reasons, you know, that might, but but very, but I, I usually say yes, you know, and try to find a way to do it. And um, and often I find that the 
video games, one of the things that's true about video games is they usually have stretched out a period of time that you're working on them. So it's it, film and TV is often like you start and you're, and you're finished. They have a deadline that's going on the air. It's going to be in the theaters. Of course, nowadays, no things in the theaters or yeah. very few things in the theaters, but Rest in peace. that's an, an, an unusual time. So that there's deadlines and there's hard deadlines and you have to finish it. Uh, with games, I find that they have, you're often on them for a year or sometimes, you know, months. Um, so it's it, because of the less intense schedule, you're able to more, much more easily work on other stuff. And of course, it depends on how fast you are. Some people are really, really fast and other people struggle to get a minute done in a day. So it really just depends on you. And, you, and the, the, so it's a complex set of decisions, you know. What's the most projects you've ever had at one time, let's say for a three or six month period, specifically games, if you can remember? Three, I've done three during a, some periods. And I, and I didn't find it, but I found that, you know, that that, that was fine. I, I didn't feel over, overly stressed. Sometimes I would, in anticipating the work, I would stress. But then once you're doing it, you know, because neither of them were, none of them were really intensely tight schedules. So I'd work on one, one day. And, and then, and sometimes, I mean, one thing I do, I, do, I don't recommend stressing your clients. Don't tell them you're working on three projects. Never. <laughs> they don't need to know that. They don't need to be stressed. You do not want to put your clients in position like, how are you going to do this work? Am I getting shortchanged? You know, don't do that, you know? And so you may even space out, you may deliver, you may write the music on Monday, but you may decide not to deliver it until late Tuesday, okay? So that, you know what I mean? They Then they, they give you something else on Wednesday and then you have, so meanwhile, you're working on these other projects. So there's ways to juggle these, these things. Um, have you found that the higher profile games that you get, you have more time to work on them or less than say indie games or others? I don't know that there's, I mean, the higher profile ones tend to be stressed, stretched out. The project that I just, I just got hired to score is, is a game, a big game. I'm writing two hours, at least two hours of music for it. And um, I'll have almost a year to work on it, which is, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I kind of, one of the things I like the time, but that's a little more time than is I, than I love, but, you know, I, I have another project also that will overlap a little bit with it. So it's that that gives me complete sense of not having to worry about it. But it's yeah. a spectacular game. I would say it's a really cool project. So I'm really excited about it. And I'll, I'll get an orchestra. Hopefully orchestras will be back in 2021. Yeah. <laughs> they are I, they are meeting overseas. I'm actually actually have a uh, just booked yesterday the Budapest strings in Hungary. Yeah, I've been I get their uh, emails that they're still they're still going. <laughs> still going. So yeah. hopefully they, those guys are okay. But uh and there was just a recording session here in LA actually. Oh good. Uh, and they did it by recording the different sections on different days at a big scoring stage, Fox Studios. Everybody was stretched out in the room and so uh, it, it, it worked out. Let's talk about payments for a minute, because this is one of the questions I get all the time from younger composers wondering like, how to charge rates and, and that kind of thing. But I specifically want to know, when do you get paid in the cycle of a game? Is this something that you mostly find to be like an upfront payment and maybe one on the back end, or is it monthly? Because I think it varies from project to project, but if you were to pick an average scenario on the, the higher profile games that you work on? What's, what's typical? Typically, you will get a payment upon starting. And then there'll be milestones. So let's say they hire you for 100 minutes of music just to have a nice round number. So then maybe 25 minutes of music will be a milestone and they'll pay you upon delivery of mock accept, uh, accepted mock-ups for 25 minutes and then 50 minutes and then maybe a final payment. So there might be four different milestone payments. And then a fi the final payment is always upon delivery and acceptance of all the music fully mixed, uh, assuming you have uh, some live elements 
that you record at the end of the process. Maybe you get an orchestra, you know, and then of course there's also dealing with production. And one of the things I do love about game music is that in my experience, almost always production budgets are separate and distinct from your creative fees. So you'll get paid by the minute, but then any production, you know, some projects are going to be out of the box since and samples, maybe a couple of instruments, a guitar and a, and a piccolo or whatever. But in general, it, it, or n better than in general, in almost every instance, in my experience, that's, I'm not saying there aren't instances where you get a package and you have to figure out, well, I want to, I need to make some money, but I also want a bigger orchestra. And, you know, you don't have to make those kinds of, um, you know, who is it? Solomon, who had to cut the baby in half. You, know? <laughs> um, you don't have to cut the baby in half. <laughs> what, what, uh, you can just, you can keep the baby and the bathwater. No, you keep the baby and uh, you can, you can uh, pay the production. But, and that, and that's, and that sometimes uh, is a separate um, issue. Sometimes they will produce the music. In other words, they'll hire the musicians. All you have to do is show up at the session conduct or sit in the booth and uh, make sure you're happy with everything and then go back to your studio and or your engineer with your engineer and mix the thing and then you deliver it and you're done but in some instances you'll be required to actually actively produce the music because they don't know how to do that or they want you to cover that so they'll give you some amount of money it could be a hundred thousand dollars it could be four hundred thousand dollars I've had as much as four hundred and seventy thousand dollars to produce a major orchestral score where there's a ton of music to be recorded, and that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but orchestras are really expensive. Yes, are. So a day with an orchestra can easily be, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. So um, a big orchestra. So in any event, um, uh, that milestones are generally how you get. This would also be true of films where you get paid upon signing a signing payment and then maybe a payment halfway through and then a final payment. So anywhere from two, three or four, and sometimes even more five payments where there'll be a lot of music and they're, and you're going to be working on it for a year and they realize, Hey, this guy's got to make a living and pay his bills. Uh, so they will make stagger the payments over a period of time based upon delivery and accept acceptance of mocked up uh, scores. An example of where you had, let's say a hundred minutes of music to write, how flexible is that number knowing that you haven't even started writing yet? Because in my experience, sometimes you start off and you want to write a four minute piece of music, but it, it'll be better if it's five or it needs to be shorter because you're trying to make it loop. And of course, when you start talking about live orchestras, you have to create the sheet music and sometimes that doesn't really become concrete until months into the process. So since we're talking about budgets, are you giving your best estimate at the front end of a hundred minutes of music? Here's the price. And then you adjust it per milestone or what has been your experience with that? In terms of, of the amount of music I produce? Sure. Because you're, you're charging per minute. So if you're adjusting, like, do you have the flexibility to adjust if you needed more or less? minutes of music. Well, let me just say this. Generally, they're, uh, on the projects that I'm scoring, they're AAA games. They have an audio director. They may have a music director. And that person has gone through and decided that they need 100 minutes of music, okay? So then they will give me assignments based upon, okay, we want a two-minute loop, and here's some gameplay video, and you'll write a two-minute loop. So I'm not going to be determining how long that loop should be. That'll be the audit director who says, we need a two minute loop for this. And then they drop it into the build of the game and they'll check, test it and see if it works. And, and then you're, once it's approved, it's approved. You're on to the next. Okay. So um, it, unless I were the, both the audio director and the composer, now that those are certain, especially with lower budgeted games might be a situation where you are hired to do both. And that's, that's sort of a different situation. I've, I've, I'm, I've never done that. I'm a contract. I've only been a contract composer. So they'll hire me for a certain number of minutes. If they, if they determine that they need more minutes, the contract, the contract will state that if they need more minutes, they will pay you at the same mm. per minute rate as what you've already 
agreed to for the 100 minutes. So if they need 120 minutes, they'll pay you, and, and let's say they're paying you $1,000 a minute. So if it's $100,000 for the, for the you know, 100 minutes, um, it'd be $120,000 for 120 minutes, okay? So that's, that's generally. Okay, all that said, I have worked on a number of projects where I've done extra music and not asked for additional you know, mm. just just because I'm in love. I mean, that happened with Bioshock. I, I delivered a ton of extra music, and you know, I didn't and didn't ask for any, any additional money. When I finished scoring Bioshock, I got a call from Emily, and she said, "Well, we we want um, some combat music because there, there we hadn't really put combat. There was a couple of combat things, but but they decided they needed three combat cues. Well, those they paid me for." But during the game, I just I just delivered whatever. I was just totally into it, you know. So in some, depending on the, the game and the people you're working with, uh, I you know, sometimes I just give them music. I don't count the minutes. Other instances, they, they're very good about counting the minutes and, pay, and paying you precisely for what you've worked on. So it depends on how formal the developer is in counting the minutes. And... Um, so that I, I, so I, I, I'm not um, I'm not uh, reg so regimented that I won't provide stuff. I mean, the the way you want to come out of a project is they love you and they love your music and you're a hero and you've done great work. That that they'll hire you again. Yep, they will hire you again. That's investing that in account. relational equity. I'm all about that. What is the worst? Yeah piece of career advice that you've heard recently about the game music business or maybe the most popular advice that you hear that is just dead wrong advice that someone's given me personally like just in general what do you hear people telling young composers that you just disagree with some things that I hear might be on the, the topic of networking some people think that you can build an entire career online but I would argue the opposite, that while those things are possible and helpful to a career, there's always a people aspect. People make people successful. And that's what we started this conversation with. You are one of the people that helped make me successful. And I don't think that's something that you had to think long and hard about, or it cost you a lot of time and energy, but, but that was, it meant the world to me. And so when I do actions like helping other composers, relational equity or helping developers and just doing things out of the goodness of my heart to actually help people, it always comes back and pays its dividends in full. What's your thought on that? I do help people and I enjoy it. I don't even look at it in terms of it's going to come back and pay me dividends. The only dividend I get is that I get satisfaction. I'm enjoying just hearing that I helped you. I guess I'm not, I wasn't even aware of how much you felt that my uh, assisting me was helpful to you and that the people you met, uh, whatever led to other opportunities. So I'm delighted to hear that, you know, I help, uh, composers who are in my classes get gigs. And when, when they get the gigs, I, I it just like, it, it buoys me for days. You know, I just love hearing about uh, other, uh, people starting their careers and, and the success that they have. And if I, and if, especially if I can help them, it just feels great now um you know so i i just think that's that's a good way to live your life talking about family and it, 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 family brings you happiness and so does helping other people these are all sort of about lifestyle you know, choices and and it's important i mean if you look at every composer you meet it's like oh it's like my competition i hate that guy or that woman whoever it is or getting my gigs. I think that's a mistake. I just think really that we're all colleagues and uh, you never know uh, when someone who is you're just meeting can become a good friend of yours. And I've had friends hire me to co-score projects with them. Um, Nikolai Stransky, my friend, uh, called me and we scored Metamorphosis together and it turned out to be a terrific score really, really cool score using uh, some Sprechgesang, which is this German expressionist style of uh, 
writing that it worked because it's Kafka. It's a Kafka esque game. It's based on Kafka's book *Metamorphosis*. So Kafka wrote in this sort of expressionist period, and, um, and so it it, it it all it, it's all you know just part of uh, living a good life. That sort of is uh, unique, to, and I'm hoping we can get back to a more normal situation. I, I know, like I, I've been watching some movies lately and I see people all at a party. I go, <laughs> I remember <Aww>. that. <laughs> I remember we could be in the same room with people. I oh know. my God, that looks so cool. They're having such a good time. And now <laughs> we're like afraid of each other. I, it's a really bad, bad thing. And I'm just hopeful that the, these amazing um, pharmaceutical companies come up with something that permits us to get back to a more normal way of socializing. Do you have any final advice that you would give to someone who is 25 years old right now that they're at the beginning of their game composition career. What is the number one thing that you would tell them? And these are people being unwilling to change into something more practical. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) They went to college for this. Assuming you are determined well, I mean, and, and actually that's, that is my sort of best advice is that, I mean, if you really want to do this, you have to be very determined to do it because it, the competition is quite fierce. It's always been fierce, but it's been, it's more fierce than ever. And yet there's, I think there's more opportunities now than ever because there's just, I mean, when I first started gaming, wasn't really even, you know, a thing, you know? So um, I think, you know, you just really have to be absolutely determined to find your way to find your voice as a composer to try to create some kind of something unique about you at, while at the same time being able to write many styles and write all kinds of different kinds of music but but really find your voice and and um, going back to the very beginning get out into the world meet people reach out uh, in in invest in and taking the time and don't be embarrassed like to, to reach out to someone and then they say, no, I can't. And I, 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 you know, that's okay. That's an okay answer. That's, it, it's not a failure. That's a success. The success is that you made the attempt. A failure is sitting at home, not doing anything. That's a failure. Reaching out and having someone say no is a success. And if you can look at it that way and you can do that over and over again, someone is going to say yes and opportunities are going to open up to you. Well, that is great parting advice. Gary, it's been such a pleasure getting to chat with you this hour. Hope you have a wonderful day and I'll be in touch soon. All right, Steve. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.